Yeah, uh, it was kind of interesting storm there. I wanted to go uh, watch the uh, waves this morning, but I didn't really wasn't able to. It'd have been neat to, but maybe they'll still be there tomorrow. Um, Mark chapter six is where we are today. Mark chapter six and verse thirty-two is where we'll begin. Where he, the disciples, you must understand. They're people who've separated their lives out to follow after Jesus. And there are people who um, really were very interested, all except Judas, in serving God, but their problem we're looking at is the problem of unbelief in the book of Mark. There is a theme of their unbelief, and it's not that they were horrible people, it's just that they had an issue of walking in the flesh and walking in unbelief. And we as Christians today encounter this same problem, and it is the problem of unbelief. Well, Roman numeral 1, the feeding of the 5,000, Mark chapter 6, verses 32. And can someone get a, Scott a Bible there? He's looking for one there. He was making a little motion for one. Can you, can you get him a Bible, yeah. Nick? Yeah, he was making a little motion for one there. I saw him. Where are so, you at? Mark chapter 6. Yep, Mark chapter 6, verse 32. Matthew chapter 6. Nope, Mark. Mark, Mark. Mark chapter 6, verse 32. Uh, we see uh, here, this passage concerns the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, capital letter A, the need of the people. Mark chapter 6, verse 32. And they departed, that's Jesus and his disciples, into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him. I know why I'm having trouble reading now today. Y'all should have seen me in Sunday school teachers meeting. I couldn't read anything. Now I'm realizing what's going on. My uh, left contact's not working. So I'm, uh, that's what's happening is I can't focus on the words. So uh, it's going to be a one-eyed day. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot thither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto him. And Jesus, when he came out, and saw much people, and was moved with compassion toward them, because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, This is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about, and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. And we see here the need of the people. The great multitude is following after Jesus, and they've come to a desert place. There's not really any food there. There's not really any sustenance for them. And so they're hungry, naturally. Unfortunately, back then, there were no McDonald's. There were no Burger Kings. There was uh, no fast food about. They didn't even have slow food. No Denny's, nothing around there. Um... It would have been very hard, but they uh, there was no food for them in the desert, and let's see. Good job, Mr. Alex. You've got the notes there, the uh, extras? Okay, excellent. So that way everybody gets some. The people here, they're in the desert. They're in need. They're in need because, um, you know, the... Uh, they've been following Jesus here. Their food stores have expired. They've probably come somewhat of a distance to follow Jesus to this desert place and uh, there's nothing available for them. We see capital letter B under Roman numeral 1, the provision for the need, uh, Mark 6, 37 through 44. And he answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? Two hundred penny worth is a lot of money. Uh, it's pushing a little bit shy of a year's salary. It's uh, about a year's salary here in the States after taxes. Um, uh, so it's about what they're looking at there. It's a lot of money. It's, it's, it would be quite a bit of bread. There's uh, 5,000 people here we see later in the passage, plus uh, women and children. So potentially quite a large number of people. Probably more men than anything because it's being a distance. Probably not as many women and children would have come. But it's possibly 15,000 people, possibly even more. Quite a crowd. 
and it would take a lot of food to feed that many people. That would take, at McDonald's, 49 cent hamburgers, that would probably, and estimating three hamburgers a person, we'll say four hamburgers a person to make my math simpler, that would take about $30,000 worth of food. And uh, the disciples don't have 30,000 bucks hanging around, if you will. So you see there is great need. The people need to be fed. They're far away. And Jesus has compassion on their physical need here. And he saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And they knew. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. Five loaves and two fishes is not going to cut it. And he commanded them to make all sit by companies upon the green grass. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and brake the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among all them. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up the twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they that did eat of the loaves were about five thousand men. So 5,000 men plus the women and children, as it describes further in the parallel passage in Matthew. Great company. Whole lot of people. And Jesus fed them all. Really, it's an amazing miracle, an amazing display of God's power and his ability to feed a great multitude. Well, we see another storm, Roman numeral 2. The, uh, the feeding of the 5,000 here is an interesting backdrop to what will take place further in the chapter. It is, if you will, the context. It is, um, if you will, the uh, background of a portrait. And here is what we're going to see in the rest of the chapter. Another storm, Mark 6, 45 through 52. And uh, as Sandy mentioned, it was an interesting storm last night. Um, it was kind of fun. Me and Charlie opened the front door and looked outside kind of late. We typically work night shifts, so we're kind of laid out. And around one in the morning, the storms were still howling, and we wanted to leave the door open so we could catch the fresh air, but we couldn't because the storm was blowing way too hard, and we'd have got wet inside. But it was a good storm. The disciples' predicament, um, Mark 6, 45 through 48, and straightway he constraineth his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. So uh, the disciples are getting into the ship and Jesus dismisses the multitude. And when he sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea and he alone on the land. And he saw them toiling and rowing for the wind was contrary unto them, and about the fourth watch of the night he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So Jesus leaves the disciples alone. They start to cross back over the Sea of Galilee, and another storm catches them. This one not so bad as the last one, apparently. They're not in danger so much of sinking, but they're really not getting anywhere particularly. Sails aren't working, the wind is contrary, so they've taken to rowing. And they're trying to get somewhere, and uh, it's not really working too well for them, but apparently they're making their way along as best they can. And so Jesus comes by walking on the sea. This is a parallel passage to when Peter was, uh, when Peter walked on the sea with Jesus. Well, this isn't mentioned in this passage. It's uh, the main scope here is. The whole group of the disciples is what we're looking at in this passage. But when they saw him walking upon the sea, they supposed it had been a spirit and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. It would be pretty troubling to see someone walking on the waves at night. And immediately he talked with them and saith unto them, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And he went up unto them into the ship, and the wind ceased. And they were sore amazed in themselves beyond measure, and wondered, for they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So, 
we saw Jesus' power, his ability to walk on the water. This is clearly something far above and beyond any prophet had done prior to this. This is something nobody can do. This is a miracle above and beyond miraculous. It's an amazing thing. It's uh, the ability to walk on water would actually be pretty fun um, if you really think about it. It would make fishing tremendously easier. But, uh, well, it's really is quite an amazing thing. And then Jesus got into the ship and the winds and waves ceased immediately. It was all calm. And the disciples were amazed. If we remember two chapters ago, Jesus calmed a different storm, the previous storm, a worse storm. And the reason for their amazement, it says in verse 52, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. It is interesting to see the uh, hardness of the disciples' heart here. They had been in a storm previously. Jesus had calmed that storm. Just earlier that day, they had seen Jesus feed an entire multitude. Morning, good to see y'all. But their heart was hardened. And um, the problem with the hardness of their heart, the cause of it really is they did not consider the works of God, it says here. For they considered not the miracle of the loaves. They had seen the miracle of the loaves. They had partaken of those loaves and fishes. But it didn't affect them. And the interesting result of this unbelief is, is that they were amazed when they should have been expecting. They were toiling on the ship, it seems, toiling without praying. And they missed what they should have been um the blessing they could and should have been receiving. But the problem was here is that uh, the hardness of their heart wasn't because God hadn't shown them his power abundantly. The hardness of their heart wasn't because they hadn't seen Jesus do great miracles. They had already seen Jesus calm a storm, but this is yet another storm they're struggling in unbelief in. They had already seen all these great works of God, but yet they struggled with unbelief and we see in them the same problem as Israel had in the desert, hardness of heart. In the desert, Israel saw the Red Sea parted. They saw waters at Mara made sweet. They saw miraculous <coughs> leadings to uh, the place of the palm trees where the water was. They saw water come from a rock, and yet again they argued with Moses and fought with him. Where are we going to get the water from when Moses fell at Meribah and smote the rock when he wasn't supposed to? They, it's not because they hadn't seen God work. It's because they didn't believe. They hardened their heart in unbelief. And we today do the same thing when we struggle with unbelief in our hearts. How often have I seen God provide? Well, all the time. How often do I worry? More than I should. What do I do when I'm worrying? Well, I'm trying to rely on myself and figure out how I'm going to solve the problem. What happens when I worry? Well, I get worried. What happens when I get worried? I get anxious. I take my eyes off heaven and onto my own powers and abilities to solve my problems and start rowing my boat. Perhaps I get somewhere, perhaps I don't. But instead of resting in Jesus and instead of resting in his blessedness, I'm busy trying to row a boat through a storm and getting frankly nowhere. And then Jesus comes and in his mercy calms the storm and I'm amazed. This is often the story of our lives as believers, but doesn't have to be. Because God has the power to calm all the storms in our lives. Well, we see uh, Roman numeral 3. The feeding of the 4,000. Roman, I just said that, Roman numeral 3. Ah, I meant Mark, chapter 8, verses 1 through 9. This is a little bit later. Not terribly long later, but uh, somewhat later. Jesus has gone to some different places and he's coming back. <coughs> In those days, the multitude being very great, 
And having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples unto him, and saith unto them, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now been with me three days, and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their houses, they will faint by the way, for divers of them came from far. And the disciples answered him, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? It's a good question. We saw a similar question about two chapters ago, probably chronologically. I didn't look. It probably would have been a good idea if I had. I don't immediately recall this. Probably from the events in chapter 7, I would guess probably this is at least six months later. Not too long ago, though, Jesus had done a similar miracle after they had asked a similar question. In chapter 6, the disciples say, Shall we go and buy 200 penny worth of bread and give them to eat? In chapter 8, they're saying, From whence can a man satisfy these men with bread here in the wilderness? It's the same question, except they're even further away now, I guess, I would suppose, from any place they could buy bread, and they still don't have 200 penny worth, or 200 pennies. Um, the, uh, we see that Jesus, again, feeds this great multitude. Verses 5 through 9. And he asked them, How many loaves have ye? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and gave thanks and brake, and gave them to his disciples to set before them, and they did set them before the people. And so again, Jesus uh, sets everybody out and arranges all, all the multitude. And they had a few small fishes, and he blessed and commanded to set them also before them. So God blesses the eating of seafood. Um, and so they did eat and were filled, and they took up of the broken meat that was left seven baskets. And they that had eaten were about 4,000, and he sent them away. So about 4,000 people here are fed, and um, whether 4,000, 5,000, whatever the number may be, it is, was far beyond their ability to feed this multitude. Seven fishes won't feed 4,000 people, or seven loaves of bread and a few fishes. It won't feed them, it can't. Humanly speaking, it was beyond their ability. So Jesus miraculously delivered them from his hunger here. And we see, interestingly enough, the disciples, instead of asking Jesus if he would feed everyone again, they again are saying, where are we going to get the food? Their eyes aren't off their own power yet. And the believer who walks in unbelief is a believer who has his eyes on his own power. When we are walking in belief, it's because our eyes are on earth and are on us, and they're not on God, and we're not surrendered to what God wants, and we're not seeking what God wants in a situation, we're seeking what we want out of it. And interestingly enough, of course, Jesus wanted this multitude fed. In his compassion and his mercy, he wanted to feed this group of people. The disciples also wanted this group of people fed. But their problem was, is they wanted to feed the people in their own power. We see then in the next 11 verses a rebuke of unbelief. Roman numeral 4, Mark 8, verses 10 through 21. And straightway he entered into a ship with his disciples and came into the parts of Dalma, Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. So the Pharisees, they are the uh, religious elite of the time. They weren't the uh, ruling party of the time. Who remembers? Who would have been the ruling party back in this time? The Sadducees. The Sadducees. They were the rich group. They were the ruling group. Like the chief priest was a Sadducee. Ananias and Caiaphas were both Sadducees. What sort of belief system characterized these Sadducees? They were sad because they didn't believe in the resurrection. 
they did not believe in the resurrection. That was they didn't believe in resurrection nor angels. They didn't believe in any kind of real supernatural anything. It's the most ridiculous sort of religion which doesn't have at least offer some kind of hope of an afterlife to its victims. But this one didn't even offer that. They were uh, they were unbelievers of a very unbelieving stripe, if you will. These Pharisees, in comparison, are in contrast, if you will. These Pharisees, they believe in the resurrection. They believe in the power of God. But their problem is, is they're believing in their own goodness to save them. So, these Pharisees, they come, they're asking Jesus if he'll show some kind of sign. Jesus just showed a sign. He fed 4,000 people. Jesus showed signs before that. He healed all kinds of people. We see in chapter 4, Jesus heals the uh, leader of the synagogue, Jairus' daughter. That was a very public sign. Anybody who was looking could have seen that sign. There, uh, he healed all kinds of people already. He did all kinds of mighty works, and they're coming to him asking for a sign. What were they expecting? I'm not really sure. Maybe uh, him to wave his hands and make a volcano or something. I don't know. But they were coming tempting him. They didn't really want to believe. If they'd wanted to believe on account of signs, there were already enough signs to believe. Uh, they, they weren't sincere. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek a sign? Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given unto this generation. And he left them and entered into the ship again, departed to the other side. So no sign would be given to this generation. A parallel passage says, No sign except for the sign of the prophet Jonas, as in, which is still the same thing as Jesus wasn't going to do a sign for them there. What he told them in uh, that passage is, There is no a sign except for the scripture. Basically, he's telling them, look in the Bible and see what kind of sign there was. And what was that sign? That sign was that just as Jonas was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so Jesus would be in the earth and would rise again. So, what's their sign they're going to receive? Jesus is going to die and rise again. And, uh, but the point was, is Jesus wasn't going to do a sign then and there for him. He wasn't going to wave his arms and do some weird mystical thing and maybe uh, like uh, cause mountains to appear or uh, turn the rocks to gold or something. He wasn't going to do a sign for them. He wasn't some kind of sideshow trickster, you know, like a uh, like those guys who you pull a card out and it, they, no matter what they know which card it is, he wasn't going to do some kind of trick for them. Um, they wanted a sign only tempting him and they sought a sign really in unbelief. The Pharisees' problem is that unbelief is hardness of heart. It wasn't that they hadn't seen miracles, because these guys surely had. I mean, they knew about the wise men coming. and the, They knew when the wise men come exactly where to send the wise men. They knew where Jesus was from. They knew all about the Messiah was there, and they didn't like the Messiah. And they came here in unbelief and in hardness of heart, and the Pharisees, they are disbelieving because they chose to disbelieve. That was their choice. They decided that they would not believe. And they come seeking a sign. Now perhaps it is possible that they came seeking this sign with a false heart. Perhaps they were even telling themselves, if Jesus does a sign, we'll believe. They may have had uh, some kind of... Uh, they might have even fooled themselves like that. But they came in unbelief. Contrasted with the uh, Pharisees' unbelief, or perhaps I should say compared to it, is the disciples' unbelief. Chapter 8, verses 14 through 21. We see first, Jesus warns them about the leaven of the Pharisees. What does leaven always symbolize in the Bible? Yes, sin. sin. Leaven always symbolizes sin in the Bible. It's a, that's what its symbol is. What were they supposed to do with leaven before the Passover? What was supposed to happen? Throw it out. Throw it out, yep. All the leaven in the house had to be sought out and pitched. And uh, the uh, thing was, is leaven symbolized sin. It symbolizes corruption. 
which, uh, you know, yeast really is, it's a corrupting agent, if you will. And bread, the purpose of having yeast inside the bread is what it does is it causes air bubbles in the bread and it makes your bread rise so it's not flat and heavy. It makes it airy and puffy. Then when you cook the bread, it kills the yeast. It bakes off the fermentation of the yeast. Yeast produces a small amount of alcohol when it uh, ferments. So when, but when you bake the bread, the alcohol gets baked out of the bread and your bread is nice and puffy instead of flat. Well, yeast also ferments and uh, produces alcohol and when people uh, ferment grapes with yeast, it produces a sort of alcohol. Well, yeast, leaven, is always portrayed as sin in the Bible. And so we see here in verse 14, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. So they have only one loaf between thirteen hungry men bad situation to be sure and uh, that's one loaf for 13 odds there are much better than five loaves for 5,000 which is one to 1,000 or seven loaves for 4,000 which still isn't particularly good so it's only one for 13 way better odds but they uh, they still were looking at the whole situation in unbelief. The reason the disciples misunderstood this warning, um, they, they missed the point here. I got ahead of myself there. They missed the point, and they thought that Jesus, when he's warning about the unleaven of the Pharisees, they're thinking on a physical level. They're thinking, uh, well, Jesus is warning them because they only had one loaf. That's what's on their mind. We have one loaf, they were hungry, they were worried about it, and so perhaps what they thought is they were thinking about, they were worried maybe about Jesus warning them about taking food from the Pharisees or from Herod. They, they were stuck on a physical level. And I understand being hungry physically and how it can make a person weak. But man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. The disciples missed the point that the leaven was the doctrine of the Pharisees. Matthew chapter 16, verse 12. Matthew 16, 12. Then understood they how he bade them not to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So Jesus, what he's warning them about here is not to fall after the same sort of unbelief as the Pharisees. So the Pharisees come tempting him for a sign, and Jesus is warning his disciples not to behave that way. The disciples completely miss the point, and it's because they had their eyes still on the things of this world. That was their mindset. It was an earthly mindset. Their, uh, as it says in Philippians, their God was their belly, who mind earthly things. And so Jesus then rebukes them because of their hardness of their heart. First, he rebukes them for their unbelief, verses 17 and 18. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not, and do ye not remember? Jesus rebukes them, because first, they wouldn't look beyond their own ability to meet their needs. Second, because they would not consider the power of God. They'd harden their hearts even though they'd seen so many miracles. He asked them, you basically saying, you've got eyes in your head, didn't you see what just happened? You've got ears, did you not hear? Their heart is hardened. This passage here is uh, echoing somewhat the passage in uh, Isaiah chapter 6, where God talks about 
their eyes being shut and their ears being closed and their heart being made hard. And that's the real problem. That's why their eyes aren't seeing. That's why their ears are stopped. It's because they harden their heart. Verse 19, he reminds them of his provision for them. When I break the five loaves among five thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? They say unto him, Twelve. And when the seven among four thousand, how many baskets full of fragments took ye up? And they said, Seven. Then he say, said unto them, How is it that ye do not understand? So, They've got one loaf of bread, and they're worried, and they're concerned about the physical things. And so Jesus rebukes them about their unbelief. Their failure was not that they had not seen God work, but they hardened their hearts in unbelief when they had seen God work. It just kind of blew right by them. It's something, as I mentioned a bit ago, we all do in our lives if we're not careful. And that is, is that when God does a great work, we let it blow right by us. The storm gets desperate. We cry out to God for deliverance. God delivers us. And as soon as it's all over, we kind of forget about how God delivered us. Or we kind of uh, figure, well, we got through that one okay. And we attribute the deliverance to our own ability to have delivered us. The disciples here are to blame, but so are we. For our own unbelief. The disciples were walking the same way and in the same sort of power as the uh, Christian does who is not walking in God's power today. And so the encouragement for us in this passage is for us with our eyes to see the mighty works of God, for with our ears to hear his word and to open our hearts to see that God does deliver, that God can deliver in any sort of situation or circumstance. <clears throat> now, we see that God will provide if only we will have faith to believe. In faith, struggling, but in faith the disciples obeyed and got together the food Jesus commanded them to bring. And Jesus multiplied the loaves. Struggling in faith, but still believing somewhat, the disciples, the second time, gathered together the seven loaves and a few fishes. And if we will in faith obey, God will bless and God will deliver us. We see that God in his compassion provides because he loves us and he wants to use us. Jesus loved those people who followed him into the desert. And he provided for them both times. Jesus loved his disciples, the ones he called to serve him specially. And in the first storm in chapter 4, he delivered them from death. In this uh, next storm, he delivers them likewise. And he brought these situations in their lives to open their eyes to their unbelief, to his power, and to the fact that he would deliver them if they would only look to him. Our final conclusion is that the disciples failed to consider the works of God because they chose to rely on the flesh instead of on the spirit. God has mighty works for us as believers to do today. Jesus said in John chapter, I think, 16, about how greater works will we do than him He's left the Holy Spirit here for us. And the great works God has for us to do is the salvation of lost souls. There is no greater miracle than a wicked sinner being saved. As great a miracle as the breaking of the bread was and feeding of 5,000, as great a miracle as walking on the water is, these miracles pale in comparison to the salvation of a wicked soul. And God has left for us the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given us His Spirit inside each believer to empower us if we'll let Him. So that way we can take part in the spiritual feeding of the lost around us. So that they will come to know the bread of life and be saved. This only happens in us if we as believers walk in belief. 
God's hand is limited always, always, always limited when we as believers walk in unbelief. If we as believers expect to see the mighty works of God ever happen in our lives, if lost people will ever get saved because of our service, if saved people will ever be encouraged because of our service for him, it will be because we're walking in faith, not in the flesh. If we will con choose to continue to walk our own ways instead of God's ways, if we will choose to continue to walk in unbelief, to walk in disobedience, then we'll never see God work the way he wants to in our lives. There is life, and then there is abundant life. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. God has something better than just getting through this life with a mediocre grade. God has something so much better for us as believers. God has victory for us. He has available victory over our sins, over our stubborn sins. God has available for us the power to see lost people get saved. God has available for us as believers the power to grow in Christ, all these things are available for him who will believe. Next week we'll be looking at the powerlessness of unbelief, uh, Mark chapter 9, and uh, also a brief passage from Mark chapter 11 about moving mountains and the power of God and how that power comes into the life of a believer. No, there will not be a mountain-moving demonstration next week, but there might be mountains in your heart and life which you need to have moved. And there might be things which are troubling you mightily, which there might be situations in where you need God to deliver and you need God to work in a great and mighty way, and it might be a situation where only God can work now. And if that's the case, then you're in a great situation because God will work if you'll believe. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you that you love us so much as you do and that you've given us your word for us to see it. Help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts soft and ready. Take out of us the heart of stone and put in us a soft heart which will believe and which will let you work. Be pleased with us mightily in the service to come. In Jesus' name, amen. All right.